All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the June 22nd community meeting. Um, we have, as I said, a packed agenda. Um, a couple things just really quick I wanted to go over. Um, the SIG architecture group, uh, the Kubernetes SIG architecture group, uh, had Clayton and I come talk about uh, KCP to them. I think it went pretty well. I think uh, 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 my own fault, I talked a little bit too much about multi-cluster when it turns out they mostly cared about the minimal API server uh, uh, slimming down the, the API server part. Um, and there were, you know, as you might expect, a bunch of very valid, very reasonable questions about how multi-cluster would work. Uh, but mostly we could have ignored all of those and just talked about the minimal API server the whole time. Um, I'm still waiting for them to put up a recording of that. Uh, but when it when it happens, I will post it to the Slack and uh, and update this with that. Uh, also, in the last week, the Octant project. Octant is a, a, a sort of Kubernetes UI, very general Kubernetes UI uh, framework, project, product thing, um, mainly out of VMware. Uh, they saw KCP and were interested in possibly sharing some of the Synker logic or Synker, whether or not they end up using actual code, like at least we're doing similar things with Synkers, um, and we could share uh experience and knowledge and they purposefully don't have a multi-cluster story in Optin, and they were very interested in kcp's multi-cluster opportunities um i would say it's still early days with with Optin. um i'm sure they are making assumptions about a real kubernetes cluster that we will break and i'm sure that we are making uh, assumptions about the type of client requests that we will get that they will break for us so uh, I think it will be hopefully productive in terms of figuring out how we are making bad assumptions about each other. Um, I, I wanted to add to that. Um, I uh, Jessica Forrester, who works on the OpenShift UI, actually um, was starting to look at some of this. And uh, she was going to try and reach out um, some of the folks there, see if there's any areas um, for uh, discussion presenting more of a user-focused perspective. And probably mostly on the multi-cluster side and um, use case side. Um, so that was the thread that she was mostly interested in. She was able to get um, the OpenShift UI, which is uh, fairly complex, working against uh, KCP and you know some of the common problems that you know it, over the years that's driven a lot of KubeAPI server um, machinery. Um, and honestly hit some of those limitations that we hope minimal API server and improvements to API server for multi-cluster logical use cluster use cases would address. So um, she yeah. was going to follow up. I don't think she had a chance since then. Um, but I, I do think there's a there's a useful sub work stream thread on um, what a what multi-cluster concepts make sense for users who are doing this, which aligns mostly with multi-cluster um, transparent multi-cluster, but not completely. Yeah. Uh, that's that's very uh, exciting. I didn't know that the that um, that UI team was looking into that. Um, I would guess that both that UI and Octin and many probably kubectl pl plenty of things uh, uh, a large class of their problems with KCP will will boil down to don't handle what is a pod correctly. Like they they probably handle I don't have access to list pods because that's a thing that you might have. They wouldn't mm -hmm. anticipate having the this API server doesn't even know what you're talking about, doesn't even know what a pod is. Um, that's fairly, I assume, fairly easy to, to handle. Um, beyond that, things like uh, uh, known limitations between CRDs and built-in types, something that uses a field selector for pods wouldn't be able to if it was a CRD that was actually that pod. Um, yeah. But but those, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of having a large, complex client hit KCP and flush out all of those missing assumptions. Some we know about, some we absolutely are aware we'll have, and some we are not aware we'll have, and those are useful to learn. So Yeah, it, and I think that opens the door, too, for, um, you know, I think a lot of those things you mentioned is our EDE tests and conformance tests in Kube today are extremely heavily biased towards whatever some tests someone wrote once, and then we, we, we shift them up a little bit. Um, for conformance, uh, or we, you know, someone came in. And it relies a lot on um, uh, kind of a all hand or a, a zone defense kind of approach, 
and it's not necessarily very thorough, we're definitely going to, as we start hitting things that are, you know, is this a point of consistency for all cube or not? I think we should be very deliberate around conformance and its implications around API servers um, and look, you know, think about things that we would suggest as, um, you know, you shouldn't assume that the core API group is available at slash API. Unfortunately, it's available at shape slash API for backwards compatibility and we're unlikely to ever drop that. Um, how do we get those topics into lists that people care about? And how do we have motivations for people to actually care and go fix that stuff? Yeah. 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 I hadn't thought about conform how how this work relates to conformance. I had always sort of assumed that that conformance would continue to exist for uh, upstream. But yeah, uh, if we start to upstream changes where core types aren't there or core types behave differently, then that will have conformance downstream. Or even like, what does it mean to be conformant to CRDs as distinct right. from being conformant for mm. how does supply work? Um, yeah. Is it a bug that pods and CRDs don't support the same patch mechanisms, which is something right. you know, David, as we're going through kube control patch, assumes that strategic merge patch will be available. and. The, the, the resolution effectively for API machinery was like, oh, this is hard. I guess we just give up and we don't do it, which yeah. means maybe strategic merge patch should not be part of conformance because you can't represent all types for it. What are the implications for end users? Uh, I don't think well, we should we should be triggering these and recording them. I don't think we have to mm. solve them in the near term. And, and to be fair, the, the strategic merge patch for us here, this maybe is the, the uh, least worst problem because I mean the the least hard problem because it seems that it's maybe one of the part of the change with hacks we did that could be quite easily pushed back to to existing you know Kubernetes. Uh, right. It's because even for CRD we are CRDs we already have the schema uh, already available you know uh, the for, for the, minimal uh, API server to be successful in like if we can find use cases which is an assumption. Mm -hmm. And if people want to use minimal API server, what does minimal API server mean? And yeah. what are the end user workloads that we are empowering to remain consistent, which is the original goal of conformance. Conformance is very little about like, does cube work correctly? And it's, you know, from an application author's perspective, can you rely on these things? And does that act as a reinforcing mechanism in the ecosystem to say, let's try to converge rather than diverge? Uh, I think minimal API server would have some implications there. So we, we, I can add that to the minimal API server implications, which is um, you know a few notes, and maybe David, I can get you to describe some things that you hit, and we can add those to the minimal API server, like a subthread on performance. Yeah, I still have a pending task uh, that I will probably tackle after you know uh, finishing on the on the API negotiation, which is uh, take back the various changes did done in in Kubernetes uh, feature branch. And really document them, uh, those uh, which are complete hacks that you know we should do completely differently, and we know it, and those that could be uh, reintegrated quite easily inside existing. I mean, the current state of Kubernetes. I mean, for now it, it's a big package because we didn't have quite much time, but it seems to me that it should be possible to document that and, and distinguish between those cases and start uh, thinking about what we can. Um, step by step, bring uh, uh, upstream. Yeah, and it, even like classifying the changes as this enables minimal, minimal API server and this enables logical clusters yeah. would be helpful because yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't. We have to separately motivate changes for logical clusters, which I, as I recall, are much more hacky. The support for logical clusters is a lot of worse hacks than the ones for minimal. Actually, API. Uh, that's not really true. I would probably say. Um, they're hacky in the sense that they're basically just the, the basic shim of an idea. The touch points for Cube are much, much smaller. Uh, the, the touch points to actually start a minimal API server are horrific because Cube is like uh, Cube is implemented as a, a very specific API server, and the generic libraries are only mm. the story. So um, and, and that, that should go in minimal API server. And I think it's I my latest PR added a few details. But I think you're right. Like we should say, like uh, anything that we have, like logical clusters would have to be justified on their own. One of the we should be looking for use cases that justify the plug points that they need that are not just logical clusters. And there are some, like um, kind storage layer plugability 
is absolutely the same thing as what logical clusters need. Yeah. And then there's a higher level of pluggability around like uh, hmm. API handlers and wrappers, middle, uh, HTTP middleware that maybe isn't justified for kind, but might be justified for something like a, um, a rate limited multi-tenant uh, cube API server or improvements that people want to make to priority and fairness or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say the, 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 the worst uh, hacks are maybe those related to serial detenancy for now, because it's, it's, it's very, you know, tied to the fact that um, all the CRD machinery is based on controllers up front. And so, and so, and you know, and stored uh, open API schemas. And so that, that's quite a pity that, that you have to, you know, index everything per uh, logical cluster, et cetera. So th that's where, but, but, Obviously, it's the part that we should not implement like this way in the future because we would not like to, to you know, use upfront controllers uh, to manage manage open API and shamans. But but uh, change completely change the the approach. So so I mean that <laughs> the place where the hacks are the worst. Uh, uh, these are the hacks that we would not keep. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, David, while we're talking, uh, uh, while you are talking, uh, do you also want to go over uh, <laughs> updates about the API negotiation stuff? There, there were a couple of uh, absolutely fantastic PRs that are large and complex, and I haven't had time to completely review them, but they are uh, very, very good if you're interested in, in how this works. Um, I don't know, David, if you want to like do the video or talk about talk about what the video is. Well, uh, I don't want to take too much time. The video is, I think, 10 minutes. So yeah. I can also make it quicker if you want. Or according to the number of people that uh, showed it, um, uh, maybe switch to questions. I don't know how you prefer. But we, we, yeah, we can, we can play the video if you think. Well, yeah. So I think, I think the, uh, just to review, because I don't know if everyone because, has yeah. seen what, like what the design for this is. And we need to, we need to write this design down to make sure that, uh, it doesn't just live in our heads, but, but basically, uh, in order to produce a CRD type, uh, you go through an API resource import type yeah. that, that David's PR defined. You say, I have these two types. I would like you to negotiate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, I, I can maybe. I can summarize or you could summarize, but yeah, I mean maybe or maybe just uh, looking at the demo would 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 uh, explain it uh, at the same time. Uh, sure. I don't know if you if you think so. Yeah, so we just start KCP. We are interested in the demo in deployments. David, can you go to? Um the uh, theater mode, so it's bigger. Mini. What? This? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wanted this. What's happening? Theater mode. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And so, yeah, here we are adding um, in, in, in the demo. In fact, we just used you know, two clusters, one in 1.20 and the other one in 1.15 uh, Kubernetes. So the east one is is the uh, newest one in 1.20, and so uh, here we just created an API resource import. That means that uh, we just you know added the cluster, and that instead of immediately creating the CRD uh, as ex uh, was uh, without any check as it existed before, then we create a, a custom resource which is API resource import, and. It, it will be, since there was no import of this API, the deployment API until now, it will immediately create a negotiated API resource. So there are two objects, um, API import, which is mainly you have one import per location, per physical cluster typically. Uh, so because you can import deployments from three physical clusters. And then, uh, can, can you just pause? Yeah. Um, and then, um, all the API resource imports for, for, you know, of deployments coming from all the physical clusters would finally result in only one uh, negotiated API resource, which is a distinct CRD, um, negotiated API resource, which is mainly the result of the schema that you that is expected to be used uh, in the logical cluster for deployments. And by default, 
but this is configurable. Um, when you create a negotiate, when a negotiated API resource is created, like here, because you you imported at least once deployments from a physical cluster, so it created a negotiated API resource. But by default, it's not published because you might want to you know import also deployments from other locations before you know uh, and having the resulting schema being the lowest common denominator from all the deployments that you pulled from various. Uh, sources and then only when you have the LCD of the deployment schema publish that as a CRD in your logical cluster and have it exist as an API so that's the way I uh, but of course you can also choose to you know auto publish as soon as you um, uh, as the, you import at least once so but here we publish manually as you saw because I patched the the negotiated API resource and then um, the CRD is created, uh, the ne negotiated API resource is finally published when the CRD is established and, and accepted. Yes, as you can see here, get negotiated API resources is published. And that means that now we have a CRD that exists for deployments that was created automatically from those, from the deployment definitions imported in the, uh, from the physical cluster. And if we look uh, inside the CRD here that was imported from the physical cluster, we see that we find the ephemeral containers, which is just part of the Kubernetes 1.20 um, deployments uh, schema. Now, um, and we can see also that the, the API resource import coming from the location US East 1 is now compatible, compatible with the negotiated API resource. Of course, there was only one import, but also available that means that there was one corresponding CRD uh, applied and it was published uh, in the open, uh, you know, logical cluster open API uh, schema. And now the, the point is to, to add a second cluster, to join a second cluster into KCP, uh, which is in fact uh, Kubernetes 1.15. So it will, among others, lack, uh, miss the, the uh, ephemeral containers uh, in the schema. And so we can see that automatically uh, the, the, there was a, a check of consistency of compatibility. Uh, can you pause, please, Jason? Was, uh, yeah, automatically a check of the compatibility between the schema of the newly imported uh, deployments, which uh, comes from Kubernetes 1.15, and the existing uh, schema that is currently being used, the negotiated API resource, which was based on Kubernetes 1.20 schema. And of course, it was uh, seen as incompatible, as we can see on the list. And now if you go into the compatible condition of the second import that comes from the second uh, physical cluster, and we can go to the next, then we can see here that um, in the message of this condition, we have all the fields that were removed, in fact, uh, that are missing in the second schema corresponding to the negotiated API resource. Uh, of deployments, typically ephemeral containers, overhead, set host name, it's uh, a number of those that were added between mainly everything that had been added in pod templates between Kubernetes 1.15 and 1.20. And so we have the precise list of uh, in the schema of everything that is incompatible. And because so David, I might ask this one, this seems like a good one to materialize as a real status field, which is incompatible fields and the reason why, or a field like having in the message is interesting, I think for tools. And then just thinking about like, um, you know, if, if we think about like, I was kind of like running, as you were doing this, I was like running through my head, you know, say you have a GitOps flow and you wanted a tool that said, go look at 15 different servers, calculate whether they're, they're going to even deploy so that you could run this in a get up in a config loop alongside like your 30 server. So like thinking about how like, we decouple this. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'd want to actually get a structured output of yeah. all the incompatible fields and I'd probably want deeper details. And it kind of felt like a status field would probably be richly structured. I think it's okay to summarize in the condition, but I was kind of like, the yeah, more it, it, the, when someone really screws up, I mean, okay. Most things are probably just going to be like one or two fields. When someone really hoses it, what does that look like? <laughs> um, maybe really hosing it just isn't that common because it's either like close or it's no cigar. 
And I think like, yeah. this is an example of a no cigar. Actually, what is this? How many releases was this? Five? This is like six yeah, five, Yes, five, so that, that's, I just try to, to take the, the most obvious example, but obviously yeah. it's not, not a case that would occur very Yeah, early. so it's kind of like, this would be a great one of like, you know, here's the field paths of all the fields that are incompatible or removed. Yeah. And then like, you know, what, what data will we need? It's not, not something we have to do now, but like, I was thinking about it like, yeah. what I want on a command line when I run this tool against three servers, get a list of output. And then how would I say, okay, given the generalized form from a CLI tool across these three servers, how would I then say, go and take the negotiated one and tell me how many incompatible cube configs I have in a directory? Because like this, this is valuable. This is probably something that I think most teams who are running multi clusters should be doing right now. So like we've already yeah. found and improved on the state of the art here. Now I don't know if anybody else is doing it. Um, there's some of the linters are doing stuff like this, but this feels like something the linters should be using as a library rather than vice versa. Yeah. So uh, in fact, how um, I created two peers. The second one is not finished. I'm still fixing some stuff. But the first one, uh, mainly the comparison, is just a, a library. In fact, it's just a function that both calculates, you know, that both checks the compatibility and calculates the LCD. If you have a, a, an argument that is a field, you know, an argument that is, you know, narrow existing, then if you allow narrowing the existing one, the existing schema, because it's it's always a comparison between two. Because in fact we do things, you know, iteratively. You never add uh, ten uh, cluster at the same time. So it's always just comparison, you know, a sub schema comparison between an existing and a new one. And compatibility is mainly the fact that the resulting schema, where the existing one or the, the LCD one, should be a sub schema of the new one. Uh, I mean, a, a subtype, in fact. Yeah. In other words, so. Yes, for now it's, I mean, and, and the errors that I return are mainly invalid errors. So uh, there is the path in each error separately. So we, I mean, we could do something more structural that one I just dumped into the condition message if it was yeah. necessary. I think, I mean, the, the format of this information is something that is relatively easy to massage and move in any direction. Getting this yeah, information, totally. even in this, even in this like kind yeah. of gross form, yeah. is amazing because it means next we just like format it as JSON well, or format it as a list of, of field paths. Yeah, exactly. That's I'm I'm actually gonna like thinking about this, I'm like, this is probably something that should be on cube pre-submits. Um, and we should probably um, I know we've historically talked about this topic. This is actually a good one, which is going off and saying like, there's a sub thread here, which is not only what people might use, like not only what we would want for logical cluster, or, um, logical or CRD, like multi-cluster transparency and all that, not just the one that you'd use for GitOps, but literally like the simplest idea, which is, can we turn the cube open API docs into CRDs and then compare the CRDs? And this gets to the IDL transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, what's our core type? Is it a CRD? Is it a Go type? I don't really care. This would probably be useful for anyone today in the OLM space, which is like, hmm. do you want to check? And then any, if, if people are already using linters that do half of this, we can let's legitimately go look at all the linter teams out there and ask them what are they doing for this? Because it, it's it's probably worth just saying like this is a concrete thread. This is the first concrete thing that we are doing that I'm not aware of a of a really principled version of it out there. If someone's got a really good version, it's just hidden. Let's go find it. Let's merge it and let's get it in linters and say it's a it's just a pure library and we split it out of KCP into you know, mm, yeah. step slash CRD tool and then you know we've got our first like hey we we pupped a, a very useful thing that can grow on its own but also be driven by the new use cases we've come up with. Yeah. Uh, and the, la the the function mainly, you know, works on um, structural schemas. Uh, so th that's the the limit. I mean, the constraint or limitation. But anyway, if you don't have a structural schema, there are already many things that you just cannot do in Kubernetes. So that seems quite a, a reasonable uh, limitation to me. Uh, by the way, if you don't have any structural schema, you just uh, cannot publish open API. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that seems 
basic prerequisite. So if we if we continue here, oh. um, we, uh, of course we have to be able to you know do uh, enforce things manually because you might still even if we you publish the negotiated API resource to the um, uh, to your logical cluster uh, by um, under the form of a CRD, you might want still to update your negotiated because maybe all those fields uh, you do not use any ephemeral container or anything else. So you want finally your uh, negotiated um, API resource schema to be the 1.15. And then you just have to patch the, your API resource import and change the what is called the schema update strategy to update and pu update published because by default it's you know you agree updating the negotiated api resource only if it has not been published uh, as you know a real api through a crd because you don't want to change um, and take the risk of changing the api of something that already has objects in it but if your negotiated api resource has not been published uh, of course you can you know uh, uh change the negotiated schema by default and so we override here uh, so that um uh, finally the uh, negotiated api resource is changed and if you if we grab ephemeral containers inside the content of the the schema of the negotiated api resource you can see that we don't find them anymore so you know, mainly we we just took the lcd between between uh, deployments of cube 1.20 and 1.15 and change that in the CRD as well. So that's basically that's that's an operator an admin saying I don't care like these two types are incompatible yeah. because ephemeral containers are there. Uh, I don't use ephemeral containers, so just let it go. Like yeah, merge that, them that, anyway. I don't care about ephemeral containers being being missing in this. Uh, yeah, that's mainly what we had discussed several times. Saying you know uh, API negotiation should be uh, a sort of calculation of impact. I mean, you, you, you check if things are uh, um, compatible as, I mean, as soon as you have an already exist, an already used uh, negotiated API. And then if you have some impact and incompatibility, you should be notified and be able to override uh, that, which is yeah. the case here. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, the, the, the follow, maybe we can stop the demo here. I think it, it gives oh, sure. the, the main ID. And the, the, the last point, but I can just explain it very easily now, is that you might also want to enforce the schema before uh, adding any, you know, physical cluster. And in such a case, you would just, you know, um, add CRD for deployments, for example, one, one that you just pulled from or created manually or something like that. And then in such a case, uh, the negotiated API resource is marked as enforced. That means that in you will never, uh, it will never be changed by any import. You, all the imports will only lead to checks, uh, compatibility checks against the negotiated API, as long as it's enforced by a CRD that had been added manually. So you still have the ability to add your CRD manually, and in, in which case, everything that you know is the same API and the same API version imported from outside will be only checked for compatibility against the manually added uh, uh, schema. So that, that's the, the way. And that, that's sort of the break glass mode, right? That's that's not something you should generally try to do because that's that turns it back into a global uh, a globally applied change, right? But that's something that you might want to do if you uh, need to resolve a conflict between two clusters. You just need to. Yeah, over absolutely. and say this is the type now. Stop fighting. This is the type. Yeah, because the case we took is is very simple. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, for um, for uh, Kubernetes uh, internal types, uh, I assume that you know you have a, a quite very big backward compatibility in Kubernetes. So uh, you would never have cases where you are imported the same API and you cannot find uh, you know and you don't have a um you know backward compatibility between all the, the the versions but now imagine that you want to import uh, some other crd or some other apis living in in other uh living externally in other clusters you might have some cases where you want to manually 
define what will be the common API for the various uh, imports. Right. Does it make sense? Um, this is great. I I love absolutely every part of this. Uh, I will uh, keep reviewing the, the PRs, but everything looks basically completely on track. Um, and I agree about the point about how how to report the differences in a in a structural, easily to consume, yeah, easily consumed way. But but that's you know a small aesthetic change on top of just being able to get that information in any in any form. Uh, so that that's great. And I agree with Clayton's. We should feel f find some way to, to make this packageable so that upstream can use it so that everybody mm -hmm. can use it. Because uh, I think yeah, that's yeah. a good demonstration of our value uh, of what we're doing here, whether or not the rest of this works out. Yeah, uh, I, I, maybe just a, a last word. I mean, towards community. I think that we've discussed quite much about, you know, API negotiation and stuff like that, but never really defined the, the use cases, uh, in, in which case there is enforcement, in which case, you know, how uh, LCD are calculated and stuff like that. And I think that, I mean, the, the first idea of this prototype was mainly to at least have a tool to uh, be able to more formalize and test already and formalize the use all the use cases where uh, APIs or about how APIs would would flow and 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 live inside a, a logical cluster. So it would be great as soon as it's 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 merged. Um, you know, is the the as many community members as possible would would you know play with APIs and. That we would we would be able to define the typical flows or typical use cases, uh, yeah, uh, regarding API compatibility. Yeah. Um, before we move on, does anyone else have any more questions about API negotiation or any uh, any possible concerns with this with this approach? I actually really like the staged like you don't just apply a crd in general you can but i mean you don't generally do that you import and that reports the status and then you finalize that um i don't know if anybody else has any comments all right uh with that uh the next thing um miguel you are here okay um we talked this week on slack i think about uh libraryifying kcp so that it can be embedded in other things and and what you would use that for um the and you sent a pr which which was great uh but i think we probably won't merge it at least right now to to uh re-atomize the kcp binary into its uh constituent parts we actually had a pr a while ago i think david did it to be able to bundle them all into one binary together um i think this is yeah. sort of indicative of we don't really know how we want to package this exactly yet so it keeps going in and out and in and out and in and out but um we want to we want to figure out how to how best to do that we want to make it something uh, that's easily consumed but that's fine uh it, i mean the the pr is not mine i think it's from no. um somebody totally else who yeah who's participating on, on the conversation yeah yeah, my um, yeah I, so this one i think is like this is a okay so we are doing a prototype. Prototype should demonstrate examples, but the point is to show the demo of the overall thing. But then the, I think what Paul is bringing up is we want to show the other ideas independently. Examples are the right thing for that. So I think that's a very reasonable one. I guess the only question would be, is everybody OK? And I think this was the, the comment of the thread is like the, the point of the repo is to show expansive ideas together. It is also going to be able to show the individual ideas, and then eventually those individual ideas will get spawned off. That to me sounds like KCP start continues to be the thing that shows the demo of all the pieces, and then we should have at least one example for each of the concepts, whether it's minimal API server, um, CRD negotiation, that shows like a very specific. I think it's the pieces that people are mostly asking to reuse independently are the lower level pieces. So those are probably where I'd start. Like, I don't know that I am that worried about CRD negotiation fitting by itself because you have to have the problem of you need to go, it, it can work with minimal API server. So I think the moment we have a good minimal API server example, then we could start going and doing it. So it's more, I'd say it's more of just an ordering problem and 
are we all comfortable with that 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 framing? Yeah. So yeah, I think I think you 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 are right. And so at the start, when when I knew about KCP, I, I was not even aware that I mean that you were using it as a prototype to to explore. Uh, uh, other things like multi-cluster, for example, um, and I mean, it, it, I really found interesting that part of the minimalistic API server based on on the uh, Kubernetes API server, especially from the Submariner um, project point of view, where we use that API server to uh, exchange information between. Uh, the clusters and also inside the cluster. I have like a very tiny presentation where I can show you that. Do you think it's okay if it's probably five minutes? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so um, maybe this, so then the one note I would say, so Jason, I think this is the readme needs to get refined, which is yeah. <laughs> in the phase where the readme needs to clearly communicate the the, the prototype's kind of pulling a bunch of ideas together. Here's the ideas. Here's what we do. We kind of were a little wishy-washy on this originally. We were trying to be like. Yeah, exactly. Because that, that if you go and you get the readme, it's confusing. And it talks yeah. about the minimalistic API server only. I, I guess it was the start to keep building everything else. I think that's actually exactly the feedback that I got from this architecture meeting also was we went into it thinking, or I mean, I did, uh, we're going to talk about multi-cluster and how mi making the minimal API server minimal will enable us to do multi-cluster. And it turns out they didn't care about that. They just want the minimal API server, which I think many of other many other people also do. So. so it's interesting, though, because I would actually say I've gotten the complete opposite, Jason, which is the only reason anybody's interested in this is if they can do real credible multi-cluster. Minimal API server is seen as, I think the people who do the tech are really interested in the minimal API server. Mm -hmm. The people who are actually using Cube are like, yeah, yeah, that's all just interesting details. I want to go make multi-cluster actually reasonable. So it's kind of like the, we need to strike that tone, which is like minimal API server and the or components we pull out or uh, common threads or either like a, a Venn diagram or three con consecutive circles, whatever it is, like <laughs> minimal API server with flexibility, tenancy, like harder tenancy because one size fits all doesn't work. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, transparent multi-cluster or multi-cluster, uh, multi-cluster so you don't have to care about it or just showing the building blocks would be great. And then Miguel, your point actually about Submariner was interesting because I would say, uh, I had the bias coming into this that applications, that how the application wants to use networking is the important part. And so I've noticed a tendency is like the technology folks are like, oh, how could I, and I'm not saying technology folks, I'm a technology folk too. People working on projects who think about the minimum API servers, like I can use this individually. There was a bias in my head towards if we all go individually, then we all just create 75 new things Ideally, I would think about the transparent multi-user, multi-cluster use case as the one that actually is like, how do you make this a hidden detail, but still be able to get the advantages you're talking about about place to orchestrate? That would be the trick to me, and we don't really call that out in the readme. Um, that was actually another thing that came up in the cigar meeting. So, so time to do a new pass on the readme, Jason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I will uh, I will take another pass to it. Uh, I think the TLDR. Uh, correct me before I start rewriting the readme, is that uh, by minimalizing the API server, we unlock superpowers. Those superpowers can be directed toward the goal of transparent multi-cluster and other things. But the one we are excited to slay is transparent multi-cluster. Uh, if we can do that, we can justify the upstream work necessary to minimalize the API server for real, for, for actual people. Uh, and in the process, we will also make it something that can be other non-transparent multi-cluster, but otherwise used and embedded in other things. Um, that is not that is not a non-goal. It's just not the primary goal so far that we are uh, that we are focused on. But definitely, it should be it should be doable. It's just not something we are trying. We're trying to slay the uh, the multi-cluster uh, dragon 
with our new superpower of minimalizing the API server. Yeah, and every time we carve a project off, it should have its own goals, and then we would we would sponsor, help drive, and find other folks around it. But the um, the pinnacle of the tree is if you have to think about multi-cluster, maybe you're doing it wrong. Or there, the, the KCP project prototype bias is that the whatever comes out of it, minimal API server, maybe whatever KC, if KCP becomes a project might have a different bias and we're okay changing the bias as we go based on what we learn. Yeah, I think, I think uh, the word transparent also trips people up too, because the, as soon as we say it's transparent, people say, but I want to, I want to tell it things. So, so uh, everyone, who cares also about multi -cluster, everyone who cares about multi-cluster today is used to having every knob and building it all themselves. So yeah. we have self-selected. When we say multi-cluster, we self-select for the crazies, and I mean that in the nicest possible sense, which is we <laughs> we are we are going above and beyond. And then there's a flip side perspective that we should always when when we are crazy selves are like, let's go solve all this. Should be like, what do users actually want? And so I still kind of feel like users don't actually want to think about multi-cluster most of the time. I think technologists need to think about how their technologies work well in a multi-cluster environment. Well, actually thinking through some edge scenarios, I think users actually want some control and exposure. Yeah, I, right? I'm sorry, I, I should have said be a bit more precise. When I think about the, the broadest possible base of users would be the people who build apps on cubes today. It does not mean new use case users shouldn't have those controls. That was a that was a misspeak on my part. So I'd say thank you. Still, KCP the prototype is targeting the ninety percent of people on Cube today who Cube meets their demands, but then their cluster blow ups and they have no solution. Um, and solving that in the broadest possible way that still hits everything you just described, uh, Mike. So, and it's a big goal. And I think like that's the thing is like uh, previous efforts run into obstacles. My my vote my encouragement would be that we that we are aiming past the previous obstacles, so we have to be aware of where we hit roadblocks before, and we have to be able to say uh, what is good enough for the prototype is that users like feel like this is net better. Um, we're still not quite testing that. So, Miguel, do you want to do your? Uh, do you want to kind of walk through your? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I will do it quickly. Was it the uh, PDF? Uh, yeah, that one. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So I just wanted to explain uh, very quickly what Sumariner is. Uh, probably most people is aware, but I mean, it, it's a project to connect the pod and services network of your clusters into a single network, and even. I will not go into that detail, but it's even capable of um, joining networks where there are overlapping CIDR spaces. So, and then it creates like virtual IPs for services and so on. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, okay, this is, and then to the next, yeah. Yeah, you can skip that one. <laughs> so this is a single cluster and this is uh, mm -hmm. two clusters with Submariner. Um, the idea is that the pod IP networking is connected. The service, uh, the service uh, IPs, and also the service discovery is is provided in terms of um, finding uh, the the services that have been exported in other clusters as service imports, and also uh, via DNS uh, resolution. Uh, so you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, I, I will not go much into the uh, into that detail, but I, I wanted to highlight the, the broker. Um, the broker for Submariner is the place where where the clusters exchange information in in the form of CRs. Uh, we have a few CR uh, CRDs, uh, uh, one for clusters. Um, one for endpoints. Endpoints are uh, basically the gateways of Submariner, which are going to create tunnels to to other uh, to other clusters. And then we also have uh, in that broker we have service imports uh, for for the services that have been 
exported from other clusters so other clusters can can find about those service exports and and we also publish uh, the endpoint slices related to those uh, services that have been exported because in some cases you need to connect to headless services or uh, yeah you need more information about those uh, the pods baking uh, backing those services okay you can go to the next um so in um uh, you have a link in there to the multi-cluster service api uh yeah, that defines yeah you don't need to go over it it's just on the pdf if somebody wants to know more about that um but on on a high level that api defines uh the concept of of cluster sets uh and a cluster set is a group of clusters with i mean uh, and they're normally uh, as administration or high degree of trust and there is one assumption and is that the services and um sorry that all the namespaces are the same across clusters and that if you export um one one service in a namespace in a cluster and you export a service with the same name in the same namespace in another cluster they are supposed to be the same so it's um the basically the mantra of, of this multi-cluster service api and then we have two uh two crds one is the service export which is used to signal uh the controller implementing this that okay you want to export a specific service in a specific cluster uh, and when you create a service export in, in one cluster in one namespace uh, the other clusters will be able to resolve this service as uh, service dot namespace dot service dot cluster set dot local. Um, that cluster set local can be something else if you want to define something different. And then service import uh, is the API form of discovering the same service so if you don't want to rely on on the on the dns to discover that service you can use the kubernetes api and use service import to find about that service that has been imported from a remote cluster Miguel, I was um, gonna ask, how much have you had a chance to read through the some of the mid-level details in the multi-cluster investigation yeah can you repeat the question sorry have you, have you had a chance to read through the multi-cluster investigation doc like how because it doesn't have all of the details for some of the topics here, but I know some of this has been discussed. How, like, just how familiar are you with the full depth of that discussion? Uh, not fully familiar yet. I'm, I'm getting familiar with it. And, and there were some like subtle things that I think we discussed in one of the previous meetings that were like, um, and I think you're kind of like, it was just like, I was useful as I was seeing the diagram. It's a great diagram actually, and it helps kind of frame that like, using service export and service import to accomplish the goal of a pod being of, a, of an existing workload being mostly unaware that they're not running in what i would call a traditional cube mode right like cube control apply of a pod and another pod and they have services does dns kind of work like they expect the 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 multi-cluster doc kind of starts by this i know there's been some separate zones like how would we do that so that the broker level is the source of truth and looks like cube and then the pod could be programmed to not know so it's, it's actually good to see this because some lying about dns is required in that model and this seems like yeah. kind of the, the slightly lower level requirement or a, a one way yeah. of you didn't depend on that transparent assumption yeah so yeah I, I agree with you like that part of having a different dns name for the services uh makes it non-transparent but this is something that uh yeah that was broadly discussed uh when when we were defining the multi-cluster service api um yeah we thought that, okay that, that was one of our goals Let, let's try to make this as transparent as it could be 
so we can make the workloads non-aware that they are, those are not uh, really running on on, on, on multi-cluster. And but there there was a problem with that, and and the problem is that. Um, then uh, maybe that that workload that you are creating on 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 an, a specific cluster uh, with a service name you don't want that to be i mean when 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 the other um, pods on the namespace are connecting to that service name you really want them to be connecting to that service name you don't want those pods to be connecting to a remote cluster so and, and this definitely i think is that it's that trick of um there's two mindsets right now in multi-cluster there's the how could i go accomplish multi-cluster and then i think the way we've been kind of framing the transparent multi-cluster use case which is we know how hard that is but the problem with the hard is like everybody's willing to make different trade-offs could we come up with a set of trade-offs that most people would be would accept for transparent, which is like say 95% of workloads that are on Cube today, which are mostly like microservices or, you know, the vast majority are like fairly independent of their cluster and then some have. Could we use the same mechanism that we have uh, so that you can accomplish it to lie? And that might add additional requirements that we'd have to figure out at those lower levels, are they achievable? But I think part of that is, yeah, like, can we come back and say like, we can use this different name, but what would someone want? And how does the, the requirement for it to remain transparent force someone to think through like? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's reasonable. Uh, at least from the, the point of view of the Submariner project, I mean, it, it is something that you could configure and, and say, okay, I want you to respond if, if somebody is querying this service on a namespace, okay, uh, first try to, look it up on on the on the multi cluster level if it's not there okay then go to the local cluster uh and and then it will be transparent because you don't need to go to the long uh dns name when looking up for the service. And this is and this is like where like um and the, like so this is like the heart i think of the transparent like uh we were kind of defining the transparent multi clusters like three parts there's like the what parts of the app, what, what does a 95% app look like? And then how do you cover the non 95% cases? Then there's the, yeah. what are the expectations when you take a 95% and put it on a cluster that you want to pretend are exactly the same? And then I think there's the, what do you do when you need a use case that is different? And what are the trade-offs you'd make? But the, I think like kind of that mindset is, Instead of yeah, I think how we can do multi-cluster networking, we're thinking about how we can make workloads not care about what location they are, which yeah. gets into what you just described, which is do you want to prefer local or remote? Well, probably most people want to prefer local dependencies, but when they want to prefer remote, can we overlap that with another requirement they might have? Like uh, today on cube clusters, you also want to prefer local and remote when it comes to the current node or the current uh, zone. And so like, I think the thing that we're trying to hope for is, and this is awesome because this is like, this is an example of kind of the general why transparent multi-cluster is trying to be different. It's like, how can we work with all of the groups that are doing this to be like, can we create a common motion that's not just we can do multi-cluster networking, but people depend on multi-cluster networking and they never know it's there which is a subtly different problem that depends on the multi-cluster networking being there in the first place. So okay. This is awesome. Like, this is actually exactly the kind of like uh, yeah. context yeah, I, 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 work with like that. Broad. I will bring this to the to the Submariner meeting about adding support for a transparent mode, uh, mode for uh, discovery of, of services. And, because I mean, well, implemented that, it doesn't mean that we break the multi-cluster service API is like a way of extending it. And, and I think that kind of gets into it is like what would uh, what what we'd love to work on is could we come up with examples of what we expect transparency to mean and then ask how we could accomplish it. And if it can't be accomplished, 
look at what would the natural way to do it on a single cluster be and then ask, okay, could we, between the pretending that we don't have clusters and you're actually on one cluster, could you make the middle layer able to use some of those similar concepts or just use the concepts up here and orchestrate? And so I think you know your point about having a place to orchestrate, once you have a place to orchestrate truth, you can change the truth to go down to that next level. And that's kind of what we've been talking about with transparent multi-cluster. Like, if your workload up top has namespace foo, that's not going to be the name of the workspace you end up, or the namespace you're going to end up with on the, the, the underlying cluster. Uh, if you say you depend on service B, that's not going to be the name of the service in a global sense, but it might be the name of the service and the local adaptation we do, whether it's DNS or whatever. And I think like, you know, this is great because most of these diagrams are almost exactly like we could put like three tweaks on each of these diagrams and be like transparent multi-cluster. And like, here's what it would mean at this level. Having that discussion is really what I think we're trying to kick off here because most people are still kind of like that. I'll go do extra work to get multi-cluster. And we're trying to get back to the, come at it from the other angle, which is you do no work and you get multi-cluster. Yeah, I think that's so. For, for the class of people, as Mike said before, who don't care about multi-cluster, but do care about resiliency, availability, API, uh, stability, reliability, movement, um, uh, resiliency for cluster failures, multi-region support, whatever, 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 multi-cloud, et cetera. So, so quick, quick time please. check. We have one minute remaining. Uh, I don't know if you want to very quickly go through the rem remainder of these slides or uh, assign more. We, we want to tee up this as the concrete agenda topic for next week, Miguel, and maybe go into it more detail and have a maybe like I, 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 I not around next week, but uh, yeah, if, if you give me that one minute or maybe extra half, yeah. I can do it very quickly. But I, I will try to join next week anyway. Or, or actually, we could, we could potentially have like a transparent multi-cluster working group meeting where we, we go through some of these topics. I, I, this is awesome. And like we could get that smaller group at a time that's more convenient to you and maybe get a couple other folks who've kind of been interested and say, mm -hmm. like, let's hash okay. out for these concretely. Yeah. OK. Let's do that. Let uh, I'll try to schedule something with you, Miguel, uh, Clayton, I'll invite you, uh, invite other people. Feel free to reach out to me on Slack if you are hearing this and you want to go to that, uh, and we'll try yeah. to find a time. Or, yeah, I, I'm taking, sorry, I, I was grown. Uh, for for next week, I'm, I'm still around, so that's oh, okay. That's fine. In that case, we can do it on the main meeting. Sorry about that. <laughs> the next meeting. Uh, if you have questions, if, if you go through this and have questions for Miguel, uh, I guess we'll talk to you on Slack or, or something. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful week. Thank you. See you. you too. Thank you. Bye.